Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, that's channel 26.1, Sunday mornings at 8.30, repeated again at 4, and also at my site, The Voice for Liberty, at wichitaliberty.org on the internet. There you'll find all the episodes of Wichita Liberty TV, show notes for each episode, and then all the other content that I and others produce on nearly a daily basis. So, uh, today in the studio, there's me, of course, and our co-host, Carl Peter John, and we're recording uh, just a couple days after the November 6th general election in 2018. And, uh, uh, Carl, I don't know if you saw my Facebook, but uh, after I, uh, sitting in the parking lot of the church where I voted, I put down a uh, I voted in another election, and I still didn't like it. <laughs> well, sometimes I just wonder, does it really I, make a difference? I, I, I like voting, and sometimes the results that uh, bother me. Yeah, that's right, too. But, you know, on the serious note, where's the Wichita Eagle these days? I mean, one of the, here we have the state's biggest newspaper, and one of the things that newspapers have done forever is to endorse candidates. They endorse candidates in the primary election that was in August, since then, they laid off an editorial staffer, and they simply did not do endorsements. The, the editors said, we're not going to do them. They printed a couple letters from citizens advocating for one or the other. But Carl, I spent a long time composing a letter uh, favoring a candidate, and nowadays you have to submit your letter on a form where it counts the number of words, so you have to get it down below the 200, and they didn't print it or really any except just a couple uh, letters regarding candidates and no editorials. Well, we're in a new media environment and frankly I've heard a lot of discussions about the media wave that was just as significant as the supposed uh, blue wave mm -hmm. that was supposed to be affecting all these races and frankly uh, I think the waves that occurred, I, I think with the money that came in late to so many of the campaigns, it was really a green wave mm -hmm. that primarily benefited uh, Democrats around the country, although uh, it's not clear how much of an impact it had here in Kansas, but I think when the final numbers come in, we'll see that uh, Senator Kelly uh, far outspent uh, Secretary Kobach, mm -hmm. and if you look at the allied money, that came in on independent expenditures, uh, I received a lot more mailings in my house from uh, pro-Kelly groups than from... Uh, Anti-Kobach, uh, uh, maybe. Yeah, well, Anti-Kobach might be, a, yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about that in our governor's segment. But nationwide, the uh, of course, President Trump in his press conference claimed victory, uh, more or less. But the biggest, most consequential shift is now the House of Representatives is in Democratic Party hands rather than Republican. Is that the biggest story nationwide? I, I, I don't think so. I think the biggest story is the Trump presidency survives the Trump campaign where they campaigned hard in 11 races and mm -hmm. I think Kobach was one of the two races where the candidate he came, Trump campaigned for did not win. I think Scott Walker in Wisconsin yes, might have been Walker, another. Yes, Walker was, was, I think, one. The but, governor there. But if you look at uh, the winners, I mean, DeSantis and Scott down in Florida, Blackburn in Tennessee, um, uh, Hawley in Missouri, and uh, Kramer up in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, there, were, there were some that it really, it, it really made, a, made a difference. And here's why it's important, Bob. Uh, the repeal of Obamacare foundered because John McCain, in a burst of petty... Uh, in my view, temperamental vindictiveness uh, voted against the repeal, mm -hmm. not to, to prevent uh, President Trump and the Republican majority from getting a major campaign a promise achieved. Mm -hmm. And now with the new Senate coming in, and a couple of numbers aren't clear, there's an election in Mississippi and they're apparently still counting in Arizona. Arizona. Uh, but definitely Republicans but have probably expanded their majority in the Senate. They've not only expanded, but you've got Republican Republicans as opposed to uh, uh, some people like McCain, and I'd include Flake uh, as people who uh, really, the Republican side of it, uh, it wasn't there. Not with the president. They're not with the president. And with this majority, Trump may finally get appointments through, which is one of the things, it's a, it's a disgrace, but the media won't cover the fact that the Democrat minority in the Senate has been blocking all kinds mm -hmm. of appointments to the administration itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, key positions in the Department of Justice, for instance, have been unfilled, although two of them were recently uh, 
approved just, just before the election. And here we are almost two years into the Trump presidency. And today, you may not have seen the news, but uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Ginsburg has fallen and broken ribs. Three, she's in three the hospital. Ribs. Yeah, she's Hopefully not. she'll be okay, but she's quite old and this could be the tipping point that prompts her. I hope she recovers, but maybe I hope she retires, too. How about that? Recover well, and retire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've heard that there's another justice who's seriously contemplating retirement uh, before the next presidential election, too. So I think the Justice Kavanaugh, of course, what's going to be interesting is now they're talking about uh, the incoming uh, uh, chair House, of the, uh, the House, Judiciary House Judiciary Committee, Committee is looking overheard at, on a train saying the most important business is to impeach Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh for what? I mean... Uh, it's, they it's, just don't like him. Basically, they're, but the real farcical nature of this is any trial that would occur in the U.S. Senate, there is no way that two-thirds of the Senate is going to approve mm -hmm. um, a and impeachment revolution. And already some of Kavanaugh's accusers are facing criminal charges for lying about their accusations. Not the prominent one, uh, Christine Ford, uh, whatever, but yes. some of the others downstream um, they've recanted and they've faced a criminal referral. So um, just in a, another second we have. So could the biggest legacy of the Trump presidency be two and maybe another two Supreme Court justices? I think that could be a very major legacy, although anytime you keep the bombs from flying, whether it's from North right. Korea or, or Iran or anywhere else, uh, that's probably going to be a major achievement for any presidency. Okay. Let's take a commercial break here, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about the races in Kansas. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV again. Bob Weeks and Carl Peter John here. And Carl, uh, we had four United States congressmen here in Kansas, of course, all up for election or re-election. Um, in our local district, Ron Estes, the incumbent, won with 60% over James Thompson, a bigger margin than last year's election. A over substantially Thompson. bigger margin, and I'd point out the fact that much was made in that special election that Ron Estes was beat by Thompson here in Sedgwick County, mm -hmm. but won in the other counties in the in that district. This, Not the this, case this time. This time, Ron Estes carried Sedgwick County by over ten points, in and a twenty point margin is a is a huge margin. Thing, yeah. Uh, first district, uh, Western Kansas, and all around. Uh, Roger Marshall, the incumbent. No, uh, real no surprise, surprise there. Okay. And not a surprise in the third district of Kansas, that's suburban Kansas City, the parts of it that lie in Kansas, where we have uh, Kevin Yoder, who is a veteran, been in four terms, um, was defeated 50, uh, his opponent received 50, I can't, yeah, 53 percent, uh, a Democrat, so well, Yoder, big change there. Yoder lost Johnson County, which is a Republican part of that district, mm -hmm. which Wyandotte County that's attached to it has historically been that it's smaller, and, but it's heavily Democrat. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that uh, that flipped uh, a positive for the president was he had campaigned in Topeka for Steve, included Steve Watkins, who was the new Republican challenger and is now the district. new congressman mm -hmm. who beat uh, Paul Davis, who'd been the Democrat candidate for governor in 2014, albeit by a very narrow margin. Mm -hmm. So that's the second district, which is eastern Kansas, less the Kansas City metropolitan yeah, area. It's, so it's Topeka and... It's Topeka and uh, the area, well, basically everything from Nebraska down yeah. to Oklahoma. So that was thought to be leaning Democrat, I think, by a lot of uh, organizations. And here's Steve Watt. Uh, uh, 48 percent to 56 percent with the libertarian polling five percent there and you know usually I thought that libertarian candidates poll more, more votes from Republicans and Democrats we don't really know that but um, so that was a surprise there and I think Paul Davis has says no more for me that's what he said it is party well I can understand the challenges of running for office and not winning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely uh, there. So, um, yeah, so that's our Kansas lineup. Of course, we didn't elect a senator this year, so uh, nothing going on there. 
So going forward in the United States Congress, you know, Dan Mitchell, formerly of the Cato Institute Economist that I read a lot, um, points out what a lot of people say is that when there's gridlock in Washington, which there kind of is now with the Democratic control of the House of Representatives, there's gridlock, which means less bad stuff can happen. Well, good stuff may not happen, but, you know, when did we last have a balanced budget? That was the tail end of the Clinton administration when there was Republican control of the legislative body and, and a Democrat in the White House. And, and that was kind of a surprise to everybody involved that mm -hmm. all of a sudden the federal debt that's on the books started to shrink. And there was even some articles written that are rather hilarious in retrospect talking about what are we going to do if there's no federal debt? And of course you have to go yeah. back to the Andrew well, Jackson, Martin Van Buren yeah. era when there was no federal debt. There were slight surpluses which simply mean we stopped accumulating debt. I mean, it, the debt is, if everybody for a whole year worked like they do and gave everything to the federal government, if the federal government absorbed everything the economy produced for a whole year, we wouldn't be out of debt. Well, sad commentary on yeah. that point, but <laughs> we we got to stick with the elections and avoid the finance for this go around, yeah. Bob. And now President Trump says he want to make 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 some deals, and of course, a lot of people are worried about Trump's ideology. Is he really a conservative ideology or does he just want to make some deals? Well, there's a lot of talk about infrastructure and there's certain some commonality there. Infrastructure uh, was one of his big but, but, issues but, two but, years ago. But the real question would be is from, from the Democrat side, they're going to have a major leadership battle, I mm -hmm. think, for the, who's going to be the next Democrat Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. But once they get past that, uh, there's a a lot of new fire-breathing freshmen in the Democrat mm -hmm. caucus who want to go down this impeachment area, and whether right. it's impeaching Kavanaugh or impeaching Trump or just impeaching uh, the Constitutional Republic, uh, it doesn't seem to matter that much. But it seems like some of the top Democrats, like Nancy Pelosi there, they temper their rhetoric on impeachment because I think they realize that that might not be a good political path to go down. Well, it's a good argument can be made that the behavior of the Democrats involving now Justice Kavanaugh and the U.S. Supreme Court caused the Democrats to lose U.S. Senate seats mm -hmm. because the senators in Indiana, North Dakota, Florida, Democrats and Missouri voted all against voted Kavanaugh. against Kavanaugh. Yeah. And the senator from West Virginia, Democrat, who voted for Kavanaugh, uh, survived. And it's kind of thought, it's been a tradition that unless there's really something really wrong with the president's nominee that the Senate ought to defer. And Republicans have done that. I think Lindsey Graham recently pointed out that he's a Republican senator. He voted for Obama's Supreme Court picks, even though he didn't really like them. But, you know, there was nothing. They were qualified. In they his weren't views. criminals and so forth. And so um, he gave that deference there. So, Carl, we're up to halftime here. So let's take a moment off. And when we come back, you know, we're going to have a new governor in Kansas, so I think you probably know who she is, but let's talk about what impact that might have on Kansas in the future. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. Bob Weeks and Carl Peter John here uh, talking about the elections that happened this week. And, you know, probably the biggest news in Kansas is uh, at the top of the ticket, we're going to have a new governor. Uh, we knew that anyway, but I guess the uh, surprise, I don't know, surprise, it was thought to be very close. But Laura Kelly uh, got 48% of the vote to Chris Kobach's 43%. Percent. Greg Orman, the independent that was polling maybe 10 or 11 percent, underperformed and got 7 percent. So, uh, whatever that means, Laura Kelly is certainly going to be our next governor in a couple months. It's a, a big victory for the Democrats' mm -hmm. party and the, and the 
folks who had supported her, yeah. well, regardless of their political party. Because mm -hmm, there exactly. were a whole faction, faction of the so-called self-described moderate Republicans right. who, who had endorsed Kelly, even though... Left-wing Republicans. Yeah, you know, well, liberal, left-wing, mm -hmm. progressive, whatever, whichever label seems appropriate, Bob. But they, I think the issue, interestingly enough, comes down to the abortion question. And uh, there's been a tension politically in Kansas between whether you're... Uh, regardless of which side of the pro-abortion, anti-abortion debate, and of course it's characterized as pro pro-life or pro-choice. Mm -hmm. um, the abortion question really was implicit to the uh, uh, Republicans supporting Laura Kelly, for instance, Governor Graves and Governor Hayden had been right adamantly out of the pro-choice uh, uh, pro pro -choice side of the uh, political equation. Yeah. And I think economically, I mean, some of those are very much in favor of more taxing, more spending on, you know, lots of stuff. So. Well, That's probably, well, that may or may not be of the future. One thing I wanted to mention was Democrats that I know and reading on Facebook, they have been so mad at Greg Orman. Think the conventional wisdom was that he would siphon away votes from Laura Kelly and draw off enough that would hand the election to Chris Kobach, and that did not happen. It wasn't even close. Well, Greg Orman wanted to be the next Jesse Ventura. And it didn't happen. Yeah, so, well, we got to know all those candidates except for Laura Kelly through their appearances on... Uh, what, is, what does that say for our show, Bob? <laughs> well, I don't know. You shouldn't bring that up, Carl, no. And I guess was, th what's interesting is the other statewide races, uh, were, the statewide insurance commissioner, secretary of state, blah, 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 all went Republican. At the same time that Laura Kelly won governor, none of them were really close except for Secretary of State where Republican Scott Schwab got 53% to 44% for Brian McClendon of Lawrence, the former Google executive. Um, is this race important or does it matter? I think it's critically important and it was very significant that the Republican candidate won because mm -hmm. uh, there's been a national effort and there's a lot of talk about which billionaire Democrat uh, funder who has been behind trying to elect both attorney generals and secretary of states because the secretary of state runs the state election operation uh, in, in most states or administers it and the attorney general uh, administers the law. And, and also impacting elections is the governor because during Laura Kelly's term, we're going to have to draw new election districts, and uh, you know that's always a political battle where office holders get to choose their voters. Well, it, and sometimes it works out that way. In different states, they have different ways, and in Kansas, last time around, that did not happen because there was they a political agree. deadlock, and mm -hmm. the, and the court ended up. Uh, the, the judiciary ended up drawing the lines. And the politicians didn't like that, which tells me that the judges probably did a pretty good job, you know. Well, um, it's one of those political facts of life that makes, like, for instance, the most important vote that a lot of elected officials cast is their first vote for their legislative mm -hmm. leadership. And so the House of Representatives will put, choose all new leaders. I mean, they might carry over some that are serving now, but they certainly will uh, do that. You know, I was going to think, Carl, that the Secretary of State is kind of an important in office in Kansas because it's a br incubator for future governors, or at least gubernatorial candidates. Bill Graves uh, was Secretary of State, then became governor. Ron Thornburg was set to become the Republican nominee for governor, but then Sam Brownback swept in. Uh, Chris Kobach has been Secretary of State, and, well, he didn't win, but he had been. Well, Jack Breyer, before Bill Graves had tried to also run for um, to, to move up too, but yeah. some, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. So in the Kansas House of Representatives, there's been a lot of interesting stories there. I don't think we have time to run down all of them, but I think most observers, and by my reckoning here, the House of Representatives in Kansas is going to be more conservative than the one that just is stepping down. There is a couple of close races that may, might switch, but at this point in time, 86 Republicans, so it's only a net gain of one in terms of Republicans versus Democrats. But if you look at the caucus, within the GOP caucus, the conservatives are much stronger than they were before the really election. Because it's really naive and shallow to analyze Kansas politics just on party membership because the Republican Party is so dominant, but many of those Republicans, you know, like the ones that endorsed Laura Kelly for governor. Here's, for example, up in District 25, which is uh, uh, suburban Kansas City, Michelle Rooker, 
uh, had been a Republican, but her voting record is really indistinguishable from a big spending Democrat's record, and I think she's someone who was seen as a rising star. She was on TV all the time. She was defeated very narrowly by a Democrat, a Chinese immigrant who just became a citizen, I think, in the seventh grade or something. Ri Xu is his name. And uh, so uh, there's a Democrat beating a Republican, but is much going to change as far as the way voting goes? Well, I, it, the key factor may be a lot of senior legislators in the Kansas House who had voted for the tax increases last year. And we're, we're a tax-raising state, despite the lies that are mm -hmm. often told by the media about tax cuts. Mm -hmm. There haven't been any for years. The tax hikes we're facing, Bob, um, a lot of those legislators lost. Yeah, they did. They lost in the primaries. Sometimes, well, some so. of them, a lot of them lost uh, in the general election. Well, we had three legislators from around speak at Pachyderm before the primary, conservatives. They all defeated liberal incumbents. So... There we go. We're running a little bit over time in this segment, so let's take our last break for today, and we'll be right back. Well, here's our last segment for Wichita Liberty TV for today. Bob Weeks and Carl Peter, John here. Um, the Kansas Senate, not up for election this year, although there was one who, faced, who was appointed, had to run. He won. Uh, Steve Fitzgerald, a senator, resigned, and they chose a replacement for him already. Probably not much change there, but there will be two new senators because Lynn Rogers, who will be lieutenant governor, will be vacating his seat in kind of central Rivers, uh, Wichita on Riverside. And up in Topeka on the west side, Vicki Schmidt became uh, insurance commissioner, so they're going to choose It'll a senate up there. And uh, Governor Kelly, too. Well, that's right, too. Well, thanks, Carl. Now, who chooses those? The precinct committee men and women for the Democrat Party in those districts mm -hmm. will caucus, basically, and select a replacement for to serve out the rest of those terms. Yeah, well, Vicki Schmidt was a Republican, well, so the Republicans there, yes. the Democrats in Laura Kelly's and Lynn Rogers' district, they may, as is common, elevate House members to that seat, which means there could be some new House members, too. But that's probably kind of at the margin. What happened here in Sedgwick County on the uh, county commission? This was a year when three of the five uh, commissioners were up for election. And we're going to have some new faces, uh, um, although new in the sense that one of them is just crossing Central Avenue from that City would be Hall over Pete to. Pete Meitzner, who's been in the Wichita City Council for seven and a half years or so. He'll be having to step down in a couple months. And how will his replacement be chosen? Well, the council members will choose the replacement. Yes, it's to a serve about process. another year. Well, the, the, that term is going to end. Uh, they'll have an city city elections for the first time in 2019. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at, uh, uh, but we've got a, a, a new commissioner for District 4. Mm -hmm. and uh, So that's uh, Lacey Cruz who defeated Richard Ranzaw. That is correct. And Jim Howell was from the southeast part of the county, with Derby, Mulvane, and southeast Wichita was reelected. So he defeated Jim Skelton, who was... Uh, Jim Howell's predecessor for four years on the commission and on the Wichita City Council before that, he attempted to uh, run, and it wasn't all that close. I think Skelton got 44% oh, uh, of the vote. 45. So, uh, yeah, as an independent, it's kind of hard to run as an independent. I wonder if he had run in the Republican primary, if it might have been much different. Well, I think the reason he chose this was he thought his chances of winning would be better as an independent. And uh, I, I'm not sure if he knew that the Democrats, if it had been a three-way race, uh, it, wouldn't have, it, it would have been even wider margin. Yeah. So I think we have some problems with Skelton as far as his votes regard. I mean, you served with him on the commission. I served with him He's for four years. Yes. much more likely to vote for big, you know, big government intervention and so well, forth but, than Jim Owl is anyway. Yeah, I was going to say that Commissioner Skelton was basically part of the a moderate majority yeah. on the commission at the time. Moderate Republican majority. Is there much? Well, it was it was bipartisan because Commissioner Norton Tim was Norton, part Democrat. of the Democrat exactly. was part of the, part of generally how it worked. Although, you know, when you say this, there was 
we ended up voting together. If you took our voting records, it'd be something like 96 or 97%. Yeah, because a lot of votes are just approving someone's yes, appointment routine. to a board and, and nothing. But on substantial things like budgets and so forth like that, there were disagreements sometimes. So in District 1, that's East Wichita and Northeast and out in the eastern parts of the county, is there much daylight between Dave Unruh and uh, Pete Meitzner who will be coming in to replace him? That's a really fascinating question, Bob, because the differences, I suspect, are going to be more biological than political. Mm -hmm. Biological? Yes. Uh, Pete's oh. much younger than uh, Dave. Well, Dave has a lot more hair than Pete, too. But I think, really, where the real change is is in District 4. Well, Richard Ranza, well, who um, is speaking out against the corruption that is obviously going on the, at the county, and Lacey Cruz, you know, in her campaign, she really lined up with, she campaigned against the Good Old Boy Network, but she ended up supporting the Good Old Boy Network. I think she was just confused as to really who the players are. Well, it's, she's been tied closely to the far left wing of the Democrat Party, mm -hmm. the Bernie Sanders, uh, Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, and her supporters would deny that, but... Well, they did. They have uh, the, the pictures. The pictures from the rally when yeah, I mean when she they, uh, enthusiastically embraced them, and um, yeah. So I think those are our policies. I mean, when new people come into office like this who have not been thinking about politics for many years. I mean, she has been involved for over a year doing the women march and things like that. But it's really. You know, like, uh, what does our friend John Todd say? Like, uh, p the people run against the swamp, but once they get there, they find it's really more like a hot tub, That's, something uh, like that? That, can, that certainly can happen, and whether it's in Washington or Topeka or even Wichita here or in Sedgwick County. Wichita or Sedgwick County. Or the school board, even. Well, the key... It's a huge temptation once you're in office, isn't it? Forces the, that people really can't imagine until they've been there. You have You have the ability to spend a lot of other people's money mm -hmm. and take credit for it yes for i mean there's nothing didn't do. I, let me tell you it is a lot of fun to cut ribbons yeah that's right that's why uh, mike pompeo called that photo op economics as you know so anyway well so we've uh, wound down another episode of wichita liberty tv taking a look at the elections i'll have some links and show notes that you might find helpful and uh, we'll see you again next week